Gus founded Project Assistance in 1996 to transform our client's approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence and execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. Gus is a portfolio and project management expert. He's a public, published author of many popular articles and books on the subject of project management, including contributions to several editions of Macmillan's popular QBook series, Special Edition, using Microsoft Project. He's also the author of the project management content in the third edition of Expediting Drug and Biologics Development, and has been a pres presenter at several national meetings of the, of the Drug Information Association. Scott? Thanks, Jan. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for attending today. First thing I'd like to cover this afternoon is just a brief review of our agenda. The first thing we want to talk about is a transformation methodology. We're talking about uh, how we make uh, change stick. So we first want to talk about a methodology for, for uh, actually driving adoption. Uh, we'll talk about that in three phases in terms of assessment, implementation, and adoption and governance. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we're at. In, uh, in this, the you are here will make sense when we get there. Uh, how to execute a plan for change. How to measure the effectiveness of change management. I have some statistics there that uh, I think you'll find uh, to be eye-openers. Some next steps, and as Jan mentioned, we'll open it up at the end for question and answer through the question console. So the first topic we want to cover is the portfolio and project management transformation methodology. And as you can see here, uh, the first thing at the top of the pyramid that we have is the idea that portfolio management represents an ability to strategize and to then govern against that strategy, whereas uh, that defines uh, something that uh, we would call a governance process at the portfolio management level. Uh, at the execution layer, we have uh, on the lower right-hand uh, portion of the pyramid, we have what I refer to as business controls. So when we execute a project, we have uh, a set of business controls that we would, we would refer to as a project and program management methodology I like to call it a set of business controls because as, you, as you'll see when we get into the high-level sub-processes of project management, if you think about it, they're really about managing the business of a project. How do we deliver on time on budget? Lower left hand of the pyramid is uh, the, the third component of, of successfully executing besides on time and on budget. We also think about the concept of how we deliver to a spec or on specification or high quality or the client satisfaction, all those things are uh, generally interchangeable. So at that level, we're really talking about how we, uh, how we drive adoption of project management process at the execution level. So today's about how we set up a governance process and how we then drive adoption at the execution level. Portfolio management, just, just, uh, just a quick review of some concepts we've covered in some of our previous webinars just to give us some context. Uh, the context for portfolio management, this idea of, of choosing the right projects, um, has some major processes involved in it. There's the, there's the idea of, of, of taking in ideas or a project intake process. So the central collection and management of project requests, uh, uh, typically followed by something like uh, some way to define, is this thing worth doing or not? Some kind of a business case. Uh, what's it going to cost? What's, uh, what, what are the benefits going to be? Uh, who's going to be involved? Well, what's, what's the general approach? Those kinds of things, uh, typically through a business case management methodology. We also sometimes will see this in a methodology on, on the uh, life cycle management side of the house as something we would call a stage gate process. So this would typically be an important gate where once we collect ideas, they really can't progress any further. They have no chance of being funded and approved unless we have a business case. Once we have that business case, uh, if, if, if we've collected a large and centralized a large number of ideas and built business cases around those, the question then becomes, how do we review these ideas? How do we rate and rank these ideas? How do, how do we evaluate these ideas? So that as we move to the next box on the right, when we get to selection and, pr and approval, we have a methodology for reviewing, rating, and evaluating against a standard set of business cases. So again, what we're getting to when we think of this idea of selection and approval is, really a planning process for building a portfolio. How do we collect ideas? How do we build business cases? How do we rank those ideas? How do we select the right projects? So now when we get to the 
fifth box that we see on the page, we talk about the measurement and response, meaning how do we track the progress that's happening within projects, and then based on the progress or potentially lack of progress, what's the response going to be to that lack of progress? And part of that you'll see today will show up in what we're calling our governance process. Uh, finally, we have the concept of benefits realization. If we took in a project idea, if we build a business case that says we ought to do this because there's a benefit to doing this, the idea of selecting projects is that we select those projects that have the greatest benefit in, 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 in all the various ways we might measure benefit. It's low risk. It's got high return on investment. Um, it's within the company's or the organization's uh, mission or sweet spot. Um, it's it's going to be done with talent that we have in-house. Uh, all, those, all those benefits uh, ultimately typically involve, uh, at, at, the, at the highest level, a benefit to the business that says, this is good for the business. This is, this is something we ought to be doing. So the final step, did we, did we actualize the benefits that were anticipated for the ideas that are within the portfolio? Next, a quick flyby on project management processes. Again, uh, I refer to this as a set of business controls, the program of project management that gets to scope definition, which, by the way, in a perfect world would have been aligned with the second box on slide number eight, business case management. A business case typically would be rendered through something like a scope definition exercise. So prior to project approval, we might see a project management process that looks like how we define a business case. Uh, the planning and organization of the project. Uh, once the project is initiated, how we track uh, status and analyze variances from the plan. Uh, any issues that come up with uh, variances that might involve changes in scope, might involve unanticipated issues or risks, have to be managed. Uh, ultimately, this idea of, of analyzing variances um, and dealing with scope changes, issues, and risks goes, moves into the next phase, which would be geared towards what happens if we need to revise the plan. How does that plan become updated? And again, some of this you'll see in the governance process. What happens if we're uh, going to uh, either invest in a project or divest in a project and determine that it's no longer viable or worth doing because the business case has changed? So plan revision uh, can involve project cancellation as well. Uh, obviously, communication of status, uh, the reporting against what's happening within the project to stakeholders, to project team members, uh, to, to the management uh, that's involved in the project. And finally, the closeout of the project and, and something around improvement. You know, what did we learn? What are we going to do different next time? Uh, transformation. So as, as we think about uh, how organizations get better at portfolio management and better at project management, uh, what we call a three-phase transformation approach is outlined in the three boxes you see on the page. The idea that if an organization anticipates and is planning to get better at picking the right projects and then executing the right projects to a successful conclusion, a transformation methodology would look like the three boxes we see here. We spend a lot of time in what I call column two. A lot of organizations, a lot of project management offices spend an awful lot of time in column two, which is about implementing stuff implementing training, implementing technology, implementing processes. So what we've seen is the organizations that have uh, a significant emphasis in the second column, or what I would even characterize as an overemphasis in the second column, tend to suffer from uh, a lack of, of follow-through, from a lack of adoption of changes in the project and portfolio uh, management approaches. So. As part of today's exercise, we want to talk briefly about the first column. And I say briefly because today is really about the third column. Today is about what we call making it stick. So I want to make sure we get the proper emphasis in column three. But before we talk too much about column three, I want to just put it in, in context that we're not going to really get anything adopted if, A, we don't have a realistic plan on the front end, if we don't have a, a realistic assessment of the organization's current state, of where it wants to go in terms of future state, of how big the gap is between current state and future state, and then have a plan in place to address that. I'll give you a little bit more detail on that in a moment. Uh, once we collect requirements, how we implement those things, those processes and technologies and uh, people improvement. And then finally, this idea of how we uh, deliver on time on budget by going through some kind of a portfolio governance process. And again, those, those major bullets you see under portfolio governance, I'll cover in later detail 
and really are the, are the heart and the essence of the presentation today. So uh, a brief flyby on what we mean by assessment, and it's really talking about ultimately the end point, the tactical plan. And, and so what we think about when we think about uh, having a plan for change are really three primary swim lanes or the vertical columns, the first three vertical columns you see, the technology, the process, the capabilities. The horizontal rows you see really are about saying, well, how do we assess the current state? How do we get some, some sense of, of the future state and what the strategy is to get there in terms of high-level strategy? And then ultimately, what is the roadmap tactical plan, the charter, that will be enacted in order to bring the organization forward? What's the roadmap? Uh, if, uh, I'm not going to have a whole lot more detail about this first column today simply because uh, if you've attended any of our previous webinars, we have a specific webinar geared to this topic. So if you're interested in any deeper treatment, uh, we'll either have future sessions scheduled or if you go to our website, you'll see a link at the end. Uh, we have uh, an entire presentation on this topic that you can play back uh, from our website. So just, just, a, just a quick contextual reference to what we mean by column number one in the three-phase adoption approach. And really within that, within that future state, when we look at the, you know, the, the current state assessment and the future state, we do that against uh, some, some industry standard recognized uh, state of maturity. So since we're going to talk just briefly about the states of maturity of an organization, uh, the, the definitions you'll see as I go through our, our tactical planning model are the initial uh, processes and standards uh, that are implemented in the, in, in the first stage of maturity, the, uh, the, the developing approach where standardized business unit processes and evaluation criteria are introduced, uh, a maturity level name defined, where there's some enterprise management processes, um, investments are reviewed against strategic criteria. So some of what we talked about and what I talked about in the portfolio uh, uh, process areas where we talk about evaluating and determining what the best projects are, some way to really do that in, a, in, a, in an orderly fashion. As we get up to level four to manage, uh, where processes are in place to capture learning and improve uh, portfolio management and performance, and finally to an optimized stage, stage where processes are in place to uh, really to, to continue to optimize the organization. And I bring that about just simply from the standpoint that when we do assess uh, an organization, we do that against uh, our model. And, and if you were trying to read the words on the page, they weren't meant to be read. It's more of a conceptual view. And this conceptual view really thinks about, uh, you'll see something called knowledge management. The next four items you see are called integration management, scope management, time management, and cost management. For those of you who are familiar with PMI or uh, potentially uh, project management professionals or maybe working on certification, uh, these are the PMBOK areas, the knowledge areas. So what we do when we assess is we, we talk about how an organization matures through the five stages of integration management, through the five stages of scope management, through the five stages of time management, all through the nine knowledge areas so that when we assess we can get a sense of what the current state is against some prescribed standardized objective definitions of what it means to be at this maturity level so that we can then say as you move forward, how do you move forward? What's an orderly fashion look like? How do we not try to jump an organization from a one to a five overnight? So, so conceptually, how do we create an orderly fashion of moving maturity forward? And then finally, uh, conceptually, that plan to move forward looks like uh, a plan for process, looks like a plan for technology, looks like a plan for uh, improving the capabilities of people. And the big box that sits on top of that is a change management plan, and probably the most underserved in our experience. Uh, awful lot, as I mentioned, awful lot of time spent in process improvement, technology implementation, training. But, but, but an awful lot of, well, change, yeah, we got that. It'll be fine. And, and I'll, I'll cover some of, the, uh, some of the pitfalls as we go through a little bit later in our presentation. So what might a tactical plan look like? Here's a simplified view, a sample, uh, a sample simplified view, where we talk about uh, maybe training project managers in a project life cycle methodology. And when we say a standard life cycle methodology, I'm really talking about the items that we talked about on slide number seven. Okay, so, so the bottom left-hand side where it says knowledge management, that's really what we refer 
to as a life strategy, software development life cycle, drug development life cycle, construction management life cycle, those kinds of examples, professional services delivery life cycle, product life cycle management. All of those things really are what's intended when we talk about teaching a standardized project life cycle. So there might be a plan to train project managers standard phase terminology with completion milestones for each phase. Good starting point for a phase one tactical plan. Uh, a work breakdown structure, a sample breakdown or an outline, if you will, of the tasks and the resources required to deliver on this life cycle. So a standardized project life cycle methodology typically would come with a suggestion of the kinds of tasks involved in executing a plan like this. A uh, definition of a risk plan and uh, some definition around a communication plan. So just a quick conceptual idea of what we mean by a tactical plan. This might be a scope of a phase one rollout to, to bring an organization to a future state. The implementation, as we get to what I refer to as column two, which looks like this, is really about how we design, build, and implement process technology and training. So the detailed methodology underneath that, quite simply, are three parallel sets of processes. Vertically, we look at, again, the technology phase or dimension, the process dimension, the people capabilities training dimension, and just as we did when we talked about assessment and strategy and tactical plan, we have requirements for technology process and capabilities. We have design for technology process and training. We have prototypes or, 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 uh, or living designs, if you will, development, testing, implementation, and rollout. So again, just conceptually, we're talking about, <clears throat> as, as I mentioned, and, and many of you probably would acknowledge in your own organization, the idea that an awful lot of organizations spend time in trying to improve project and, and portfolio management and really what I call uh, uh, categorically implement stuff, okay, which is a little bit slangish, but it's really about putting things out there for the organization to use, oftentimes without the benefit of an upfront plan and assessment and of a back-end uh, governance and adoption phase. Which brings us really to the heart of today's conversation, which is this idea of how we make it stick. So the idea is that if we've gone through the phases, if we've gone through and had an assessment and a strategy and a tactical plan, if from that plan we've done something like I showed you in the sample plan, we've implemented some training, we've got some standard work breakdown structures for project plans, we've got a risk plan, we've got some uh, communication around the plan, uh, really now what? You know, what, what do we do at this point? We, we've got it out there, and uh, I'm going to talk about a best practice and I'm going to talk about some pitfalls or, or, or anti-best practices, if you will. So again, we're in column three. And if we break down uh, what it says under project governance, what we'll see is, again, we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about implementing process-specific theory, the theory of portfolio and project management, but organization and process-specific. We're talking about technologies and tools to support that and streamline and enable it. And we're talking about the people that have capabilities that need to be mature enough and experienced enough and knowledgeable enough to be able to bring those integrated technologies and tools forward and to be effective. All arrows point to executive support because just like we've rarely seen uh, a column two implementation work without a solid column one and a solid column three, we certainly have never seen uh, the implementation of people, process, and technology without strong executive support, which really comes from this fourth dimension, this idea of how we how we manage change. We're implementing change. We're talking about cultural embeddedness. We're talking about lack of knowledge sometimes in the people, new processes, unfamiliar technology. So really for today's, the, the you are here part is, uh, we are uh, in today's presentation really talking about this dimension, this column three dimension about adoption and governance. Um, a little bit more detail in column three. So what you, saw, what you saw before in column three was high level uh, one, two, three, four, five, six bullets. So what I want to do right now is really take you through a little bit more detail of what those bullets are about. So as we talk about that uh, off-the-shelf ad hoc approach, a column two implementation that's not done with a strong strategy and tactical plan on the front end and without thought to adoption and governance, will typically deliver something like off-the-shelf trading, meaning it's not customized to your process, 
And oftentimes we hear we're going to use the technology out of the box, which says that the organization is going to not have any organization-specific use of the technology, which can work. But with off-the-shelf tech, uh, off-the-shelf theory approach, even the off-the-shelf technology or out-of-the-box technology is not typically well integrated. The second column is where we start to see things come alive a little bit. You know, the next level of maturity or adoption uh, maturity in the continuum is about the organization-specific tailored approach to how we bring together process technology and training. So if you look in that box, you can see it going from sort of the, uh, the cool blue on the left on the top where it says the change management continuum up to the sort of uh, red hot on the right, meaning, as we said, turning up the heat to drive portfolio management and life cycle adoption. What you're going to find is, as I, as I unfold these various boxes across the screen about making it stick, we see uh, probably some organizational discomfort. Some of this, are, are we really ready for this? Are we really ready to drive this level of change in the organization? Are we ready to take the level of serious steps that are involved to really drive adoption and make it stick? Because as you'll see here, first of all, to, to not do training off the shelf means we've got to take time, which means investment, in integrating process and technology. We need to have a, draw, a job role focus rather than a pure theoretical framework. We need to have strong alignment to technology uh, when technology, assuming it's re relevant, right, when technology is being used. So, so what we see is this, you know, this focus on success that says when people leave training, they know how to do their job. They weren't shown a nice way to do it. They're shown how they're expected to do it within the organization. Now comes the question of what happens when training ends? What happens when people leave the classroom when they're told go forth and multiply and be successful and please use the things we just showed you? Uh, the next, the next uh, level of time and investment and follow-up that occurs is ad hoc uh, meaning upon request training, not what we recommend. Uh, what we recommend is mandatory regular mentoring sessions. So, so to coach and, and, and to support the people that have been through training, to provide that coaching and mentoring support on a regular basis. Uh, oftentimes individual group follow-up, that, that's uh, not necessarily uh, the primary driver of success. The fact that it happens is the primary driver we see. The other thing we'll see is a, is a skill improvement curriculum. We take people through training, but we know it's too much, or we know we can't keep them in the classroom for more than two days. So how do we kind of have some sort of a, a curriculum that says, well, we're going to go ahead and implement a simple set of processes, and then the tactical plan says over time we're going to layer in some increasing levels of sophistication and complexity and rigor, project management rigor at the execution level that says we're going to make this uh, uh, even better as we go through time. So oftentimes that's supported by a curriculum. And the primary focus of all this, again, is the integration of technology and process. With the, uh, with, with the final thought here being uh, the ones that we see are successful are less about policing and more about supporting and helping. The, the less we make this do it or else, the, the, the easier it's going to be for the organization to, to move forward and to really drive some change. Not that this is optional. I'll talk about that in a moment but that the folks who are responsible for the coaching and mentoring and support, in fact, have more of a, uh, uh, a helping hand approach as opposed to a policing, we're going to put you in jail and write your citations and sentence you to, uh, to time if, uh, if, in fact, you're not doing it. There's a time when that's appropriate, but not yet. Uh, the next thing we see is once, once uh, coaching ends and, uh, or, or once ongoing coaching is in place, well, it shouldn't end, actually, but once it's in place and it's moving forward, the question then becomes, how do we assure that the process is being followed? If we had a tactical plan, if we implemented some training technology and process, at what point do we understand whether or not adoption is, is happening? And, and we strongly recommend uh, an, an, an adoption review and audit process where we, again, we have the uh, portfolio governance and project execution processes integrated. What do I mean by that? Well, when, when we talked about the high-level portfolio processes, okay, we talked about on slide eight, this idea of measure and respond. So once we approve a project at the portfolio governance level, there's, there's this responsibility, if you will, of the governing bodies of, of, the, of the stakeholders, of the steering committees, of the executive management, of the sponsors, to hold people accountable. 
Right? When we talk about a governing body, we typically don't find project managers volunteering to cancel their projects. Right? Project managers, we project managers go through the seven stages of death or the whatever they are, however many stages, just like real people do. Right? So the first stage of, 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 uh, of the stages of death is denial. So the, the idea here is that how do we catch the denial stage or the this doesn't apply to me stage by measuring and responding? So a little more detail on that says, well, we have a governance process. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple of boxes as I, as I unfold the rest of this slide here. But really, we're talking about an audit process that drives portfolio and project management, management maturity and adoption, that there will be project reviews and that it's not going to be optional. And oh, by the way, as part of that review is, again, we turn up the heat. What happens as a result of those views? What do we do about it? Do we just ask tough questions and then release people from the room? Or is there some kind of a follow-up where we augment the audit process with some sort of standardized grading, whether it's variance analysis, whether it's financial impact, whether it's whatever those typical things are that we would measure a portfolio against, how we summarize and grade and report and escalate that says, as we find out the projects are in trouble, number one, or number two, they're not in trouble, but they're not following the process, that's a red flag as well. That's an audit thing that says, you may be bringing in your project on time and on budget, but if you're not following the process, that's not okay. So the idea of how we escalate, what do we mean by escalate? Well, who are we going to talk to once we have a problem? Who are the stakeholders, sponsors, executives, funders, holders of the purse strings that need to be involved? The grades for project help and process adoption are reported to stakeholders. And, and, and hopefully, and one of the ways we drive and we make it stick is that there's some uh, integration with performance plan, planning, evaluation, and compensation. So the folks responsible for driving the portfolio, the, the, the folks responsible for executing the projects have responsibilities that really need to be part of their job. And if it's part of their job, clearly it's part of the, 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 the job descriptions, it's part of the performance planning, it's part of how we evaluate folks, and ultimately it's part of how we compensate and reward people for doing their job or potentially the opposite for not doing their job. And finally, we talk about this idea of intervention and corrective action. Not only do we have a grade, not only do we report to stakeholders, but again, as we turn up the heat, now we're really having some bravery, we're really having some good rigor in our process where we start looking at specific actions that are based on project health. And what are those actions? I mentioned earlier the terms invest or divest. Okay, so either we have a change management process, again, going back to how we do projects, back on slide seven, as we started getting, in, I'm sorry, slide nine, as we started getting into the process, we talked about communicate. I'm sorry, we talked about uh, tracking and analyzing variances and then managing scope. So if we have a variance, what's going to happen? Who cares? Who hears about it? In a well-defined and optimized portfolio governance environment, it's not the project managers deciding whether the scope gets changed, or it's not the project managers begging for somebody to listen to them because there's something that needs to be heard, that the project is going to take longer, it's going to require more resources, uh, that, 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 the, that the constituents from the business are asking for more and more stuff, or we just didn't estimate very well and there's a lot more that needs to be anticipated. All of those things ultimately result in some decision as to whether or not we continue to invest in this project. Again. Back to slide nine. What about the beginning when we talked about planning and organizing or defining scope, or even on slide eight when we talked about having a business case? Well, as we run a project, we're going to find out that the business case either changes or what or stays the same but can't be met. New competitors have entered the marketplace. Increased costs are making this a difficult project. How about what happened last year? The economy tanks and we decide we can't do as many projects as we wanted to do. So we need to reevaluate and say, well, okay, which ones are we going to do? Or what if the market has changed? What if we now send our focus to selling to the federal government instead of commercial enterprises because that's where the investment is? All of those decisions ultimately are going to come out of this idea for how we invest and divest. Change management or stop the project. Project cancellation processes. So a well-honed, optimized adoption process and governance process is going to be about governing the projects to the point where we say, do you have a cancellation process? Is it formalized? If it doesn't meet certain criteria, we stop the project. I'm sure we've all seen in our lifetime, and probably some of you in your current lifetime, good projects that have gone bad, and there's good money being sent against bad, uh, sent against bad projects. The analogy I always uh, use, and you might have heard me use this before, 
is the train has left the station, we find out the bridge is out, and we don't stop the train. We might change the plan to say that the plan is now to get our passengers wet or to teach them how to swim, but we don't, we don't stop the train. And again, the incentive system tied to actual project performance. And, and performance can be not only the performance of the project, but the performance of the project managers and the governing bodies to drive adoption, to accept adoption, and ultimately to help make it stick. Okay, so that's really what we mean when we talk about process improvement and adoption. So, so executing a plan for change uh, really involves a lot of what we've just talked about. So again, going back to what was the plan, well, you know, what kind of change are we driving here? Well, the example I used a couple slides ago was we have a plan, uh, again, a simplified plan or a sample plan that says we're going to train the project managers on the use of a life cycle methodology. We're going to standardize terminology with completion milestones. Standard WBS, meaning sample tasks in the project plan. Definition of a risk plan, some way to report against the original plan, how's it going, up-to-date pro up project summary, actual versus baseline. Okay, so executing a governance process that drives change means uh, that we actually have a process. Okay, so what do we mean by a process? Well, typically we mean there's some set of inputs, there's some set of outputs, and there's some sort of transforming steps that says, well, how do we, in fact, turn the inputs into outputs? How do we turn a project request into an approved project? How do we turn a project status report into an audit report? How do we turn an audit report into an action plan that says we're going to invest or divest or go ask an executive steering committee for more funding or, or, or maybe recommend the cancellation of a project? These are all processes. Just like project management scope definition is a process, stopping a project, canceling a project, reporting a project to stakeholders, all these are processes. They have frequencies. They have attributes. Which ones go through the process? Is every project going to be audited? Maybe not. Would a two-week project be treated equally? As a five-year, $30 million project, probably not. So we may see some attributes in terms of the size of the project, the duration, the number of locations involved, the number of resources involved, defining some of the hurdle rates or some of the, the lines that you have to go above or below in order to be in, in the audit process. So defining a governance process, executing a process. Again, we talked about the review, audit, and support in capital letters, not policing as much as support, hopefully. Um, evaluating projects, reporting on projects, and follow-up based on project health and process adoption. What do we mean by follow-up? Well, would you follow up as often on a healthy project as you would on an unhealthy project? Would you follow up as often on a project that has good compliance and adoption of process as often as you would on one that's absolutely non-compliant and doesn't look like it has any plan to get there anytime soon? So all of these kinds of of outcomes from, from the governance process can and will drive how often a project needs to be re reviewed. I, was in, I worked for a company uh, where, depending on the state of, of health of the project, the escalation went higher and higher in the organization to the point where you became relatively famous relatively quickly in front of some people you'd rather not be famous in front of if, in fact, your project wasn't going well. And by the way, you got to visit that person on frequent uh, calls you got to go once a month instead of once a quarter, and you got to stand in front of, uh, uh, you know, an executive with, uh, with all the directors that reported to that executive to explain why we haven't yet adopted the process or why we haven't been able to get the project back on track. And obviously continuous improvement. Uh, reporting from the governance process. I mentioned reporting. I just wanted to use a couple of quick examples. When we talk about reporting, we can have some sort of a summary report that says, um, you're in an A status, there's no known issues, and the project's under control. And by the way, your reporting frequency just became quarterly instead of monthly. Or you don't have to take it to the Executive Steering Committee. We're going to keep it at the manage, uh, level one management and not escalate because there's no issues. There's no known issues and things are under control. What's a B status? Things are going okay, but there's a but. Right? There are some known issues, but fortunately there's an action plan in place to mitigate risk. So there are some variances, there are some issues, there are some risks starting to realize themselves, but it's being managed, it's under control. What might happen there? We might increase reporting frequency. We might escalate one level within the organization. We might make some stakeholders aware of it. We might have some stakeholders for some support. Again, this is about support, hopefully. We're going to bring help for the project manager. Uh, a C grade, not on time, on budget, on spec. So it's already falling behind, but again, there's a plan in place. 
D, not on time on budget on spec with no plan to get back on track. There's risk of failure. I see this described as significant financial losses, uh, potential of significant financial loss to the organization or, or high impact to customers or, or, or. We can define that in a lot of different ways. And, and an F says, uh, pull the plug. This thing's beyond hope. It's been a D for a while. It continues to get worse. Uh, we should divest on this project and send these dollars elsewhere. So just some examples of what we might see come out of a governance reporting and auditing process. So I mentioned some of these things already, right? Evaluation outcomes. You stay on a regular cycle. You increase the cycle. Uh, so we, 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 we start uh, escalating the reporting of critical issues to the owning executive. Uh, again, I mentioned increasing frequency at a level C. Uh, the owning executive now gets invited to the meetings, which is uh, not comfortable. Project manager uh, maybe gets replaced. Uh, when I worked at IBM Professional Services, they had something they called the single bullet theory. And the way they described that was if you had a gun with one bullet on it, on whom shall you use it? And the typical, an typical answer was the project manager. Right, wrong, or, or indifferent, that was the answer. If it's not on time, on budget, on spec, and, and the project manager hasn't been proactive about doing something about it, we might replace the project manager. Uh, we might keep the project manager, but escalate reporting because we need some executive support. And level F, I mentioned already, if, we, if we're recommending cancellation, um, there should be a cancellation process. We might go on hold. We might decide, decide to revisit next year after risk changes or market conditions change. And again, well, you know, what are we talking about here? When we talk about adoption, we're talking about really defining the role of a project management office as well as the business steering committees. We, we see mixed uh, roles, and really a lot of this is a, it depends, right? How much of this would be done by a project management office, assuming there is one? How much, would, how much of this would be done by a business uh, steering committee? And really it comes down to the mission as, as it's defined within the organization. Part of what we see happening when we talk about an initial assessment, when we talked about the three columns, at an initial assessment, and we think about defining a current state, okay, a tactical plan, a chart, or a scope, we're really thinking about something, something that speaks to the future state of the organization that says, where are we going to land? What is the mission? What are the roles of the steering committees of the PMO? If we have a tactical plan and an approach to take us somewhere, clearly part of that are roles and responsibilities of the organization. So then now that we get to adoption, we have some sense of how escalation occurs when a project is in trouble. Who has the authority to cancel a project? What is the process? What happens if a project needs more time, more resources in order to meet the original expectations of the charter? Can we go get more money? How does that happen? Can we go find more time? Can we re-baseline the project and, and reset the expectations of the portfolio go, uh, reporting level? So what if a project manager needs to be replaced or counseled? Again, through a, through a uh, an evaluation process potentially is what we see sometimes here. Um, what if what if the business case has changed? Right? I mentioned market conditions, ROI, degree of difficulty, risk, alignment with business goals. All those things will change over time. How is that dealt with? Again, if we're talking about a project manager whose primary job is to talk about on time, on budget, on spec, we've got some other things here that aren't necessarily about being on spec. I could deliver a gas guzzling escalator that gets two miles to a gallon and it's on spec, but have market conditions changed since oil went over $100 a barrel? Has the ROI changed in terms of how many people are going to buy these things? Um, are our business goals misaligned? Do we want Congress to know that we're General Motors and we're producing more gas guzzlers? So the fact that a project manager can say, yes, I can deliver that gas guzzler on time, on budget, on spec, is interesting, but doesn't get to the full breadth of what we, what we really want to see when we talk about measure and respond at the portfolio level, again, what we're talking about is some ability to go in from a project management standpoint and, and, and track and analyze. But again, what am I analyzing? If it's not on budget or spec, I probably have to jump back up to the portfolio level where we talk about measure and respond. What are we measuring? It's really the governance committees that are responsible for saying that's interesting that you're on time, on budget, on spec. But is it you, the project manager's job, to say this is not a market viable product? Or is it somebody in marketing? Is it somebody in sales? Is it somebody in the business unit that really suggested this was a good idea? Okay, so we see this drive for an integration of portfolio and project management to be successful. 
So if the original parameters have changed to approve and fund the project, uh, I may not even find that in my project status report. Or if I do, we've got to let the project manager know it's their job to go tap marketing and to go find out what the new business case is to change those parameters in my, in my portfolio reporting process. Organizational systems, what's their role in making it stick? Okay, so I mentioned this briefly, right? Policies and guidelines and compensation plans. So clearly, performance planning and evaluation, the linkage of project outcomes to a performance plan. But again, not only the project outcomes, it's okay to be on time, on budget. Gee, we, we appreciate that and to be on spec. But if you're not following the process, that can be an issue as well. So we want to measure, if we, eva if we plan and evaluate a project manager's performance, not only did you come in on time, on budget, on spec, but you're following the process and you're adopting it. One of the issues we see sometimes here are some really experienced senior project managers who probably don't need the process. They're pretty good at what they do, and despite any new process that rolls out, they'll continue to be successful. We still need their support. We still need their, their, their example to step forward and to show that, that, that our best project managers are in support of the organizational goals and missions. And again, the compensation systems, right? Uh, pay increases, bonuses, um, goals for, uh, tied to uh, goals for the project outcomes, and again, goals for process adoption. So just uh, before I turn the floor over for questions, I want to just cover a, a couple of concepts in terms of uh, is this worth doing? How would you sell this in your organization? If you like what you're hearing today, if you think your organization needs to change, in today's environment, there's really pressure to change and pressure to save at the same time. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of organizations realizing they can, they can no longer afford to be 60 or 80 percent right on their project deliveries. There's really a need to improve performance. So the question I would have is, is we're going forward to your organization saying, well, you know, we really need to improve our project management maturity. What's that worth? Is it worth improving project management maturity? What are the benefits? Are there, are there, any, are there any known benefits out there? So if I'm going to go Again, back to the project management maturity, and talk about moving the organization from its current state of initial or developing forward into defined or managed from a one or a two to a three or a four, or maybe even a five. Um, is it worth doing? Does anybody really think this is worth doing? Okay, so measuring the effectiveness of change really talks about is there a return on investment of this project? If we're asking the organization to invest in change, and, and to change the way we do portfolio and project management, what's so good about it? And what you're going to see is some of the ideas uh, in, uh, cast in somewhat numerical fashion of, well, my projects will be done sooner, or we'll stop overrunning our budgets, or it won't happen as, as often, or it gets eliminated, or, or that we're going to stop investing in bad projects. These are all worthwhile endeavors, but selling this to management, especially in today's environment, can be difficult. So here's, here's a, uh, a quick report that shows some before and after in project efficiency. All right, so before the change, alignment with company goals was 68%, and, and we can see it improved by 27%. How many projects we get done? Yeah, we can do more projects, and we stop wasting money, and we, we use our, our resources more effectively. Uh, the average uh, project staff full-time equivalents. So we go from using 20 people on a project to 17 and a half. Uh, the cost. So th we see, I, I, you see that circle there, 37% improvement. Is that worth doing? If our average cost, cost of a project was half a million dollars and just dropped down by about almost 40%, by saving almost $200,000 per project, could I pay for a plan and, and, and an implementation and a process governance and adoption approach to go forward and, and achieve those return on investments. And here we see the numbers. Um, average time of projects. They're taking less time. Projects per project manager. My, my, my project managers can manage more projects. First time I saw this, my head hurt. But what I realized was the amount of time a project manager takes to manage a project gets reduced as an organization matures. Some of the industry averages that say we need 15% of the total effort to go towards project management, we can see that dropping down in the 12, 10, or maybe even 8% range by moving up into the four and five levels of maturity. And when we talk about levels of maturity, there's some industry metrics out there too. So as we talk about moving into some of these more 
uh, higher level maturities. And by the way, IDC uses a slightly different uh, numbering scheme, but you can still see the you know the same basic approach here. That, that as we see movement uh, of projects move projects managed with uh, portfolio and project management, we see it going from three quarters to 100 percent. And uh, how many months you've been using PPM? Well, it takes a while for this to happen. So there's an adoption time frame. There's a baking time, if you will, to make this happen. Um, we go from two thirds of our projects aligned with company goals up to three quarters, up to almost 100 percent. The projects that are failing, we go from half of our projects failing to maybe only 16 percent. Or the way I like to describe this is fail faster. Okay, they may still be failing, but we're saving money because we catch them sooner. We catch them in the audit review process. We stop them because we have a cancellation process. And everybody understands that and is aware of that and isn't afraid to use the word failure. Redundant projects. Doing the same project twice starts to drive down. Projects over budget. This is a big one. A third of projects being over budget. I've certainly seen higher numbers than that, down to 10%, 13%, one out of eight. And project redos. This, to me, is one of the biggest uh, metrics out there. We can't afford in today's environment to do projects over. We can't, we can't expect to keep our jobs if we, if we have to do projects over. So, uh, you know, what used to be uh, an acceptable failure rate or an acceptable number of projects missing their specs, missing their budget, missing their timelines, there's just a lack of tolerance for that kind of behavior uh, going forward in today's environment. And finally, ineffective change. Just a couple quick examples I'd like to talk about. Uh, you know, we've certainly been around this idea of, of, of doing all three columns of uh, assessment, implementation, and uh, adoption and governance. And uh, I'd love to tell you the majority effectively drive change. And I'm sure you've seen some experience in your own lives where uh, some of the stats that are out there are probably less than half of the organizations really successfully adopt change. So we, you know, we have some we have some experience in terms of some patterns that have emerged about how this works. Uh, certainly. You know, the biggest one we see is the fact that it takes time, right? So we're pushing this boulder uphill, and uh, it's pretty hard to get momentum to, to, to get an organization to change the way it uh, both selects and approves its projects through portfolio governance, as well as how we actually run our projects. And, and you know, the unfortunate reality is without that executive support in the middle that we saw earlier, uh, we get that boulder halfway up the hill and it rolls back down the bottom and we got to start pushing it back up the hill again. So. So ineffective change, really this one is, is really about, about grassroots movements. Right? When we've seen a grassroots movement to drive change, what I, what I really mean by a grassroots movement is this idea that the, the, missing, the missing middle part is just isn't there. We, you know, we've got some theory, we've got some process, we've got some technology, we've got some tools, but the change management and the executive support just isn't there. And when the change management and executive support isn't there, uh, we start seeing the, the Sisyphus effect, who is the, uh, the team mascot, the Greek god for, uh, for ineffective change. Uh, the other one we see is that, you know, the PMO role, who really has a policing role. They, they carve their Ten Commandments, and I call it the Moses model. You know, we carve our Ten Commandments into stone, and then we use those stone tablets to beat people over the head and drive change that way. So, again, a, a more mature role for a PMO is one in which it really does invest in the coaching, the mentoring, the auditing, the supporting to really drive effective change. And finally, what I affectionately refer to as the memo from Bob, or the memo from Julie, or the memo from somebody on high that says, you're going to do this or else. Okay, so it's a little bit like the stone tablets. It's, it's an executive wielding the stone tablets instead of the, uh, the, the PMO. But it says, hear ye, hear ye, starting next Monday, thou shalt follow all edicts as proclaimed by the leadership of our PMO. Tell you to do so will result in beating continually until morale improves or something silly along those lines. But it doesn't work. Just doesn't work. So what I'd like to do is just spend a minute uh, or two talking about some next steps, uh, some ways in which uh, we can continue this conversation if there's some desire to do so, and then I'll turn the floor open for some questions and answers. So the next steps, uh, in terms of column one, a maturity, improvement, readiness, assessment, briefing, um, if there's a desire to do this, uh, we can certainly uh, work with you and your organization to determine your requirements for uh, improvements in your portfolio and project management. Typically what we see is there's, uh, there's project reporting issues, there's a technology environment um, that's out of kilter. 
There's uh, uh, resource planning is always a big one. Uh, there's a desire to do uh, effective capacity planning because we can't know which projects we can do next year until we know how long this year's projects are going to take and how many people they're going to use. And really an ineffective portfolio and project management process leads to some pretty poor forecasts for resource plans. And frankly, you can't get them to go well until you start to mature pretty high on the maturity level, probably a three or a four. So if that's an issue in your organization, we can help. And certainly the idea of portfolio and project management uh, adoption and governance. So the kinds of things we help you look at is really to take that methodology, and, and this is uh, initially a complementary, to go through uh, the PPM capabilities and review your organization's current and future state, get a, a basic roadmap to justify investment and supporting the PMO. Uh, look at the common challenges with this ill-conceived methodology deployment and uh, technology deployment and the harmful effect it has on the initiatives. We don't want to do that. We tried it before. It didn't work. Get away from it. And that's a problem. And that's, you know, that, that's a real sort of embedded political base that gets out there that, that, that's very resistant to change. Uh, common training and competency development shortcomings. Uh, usually going too far too fast. Try to implement a lot. Asking you know, the average project manager with, with maybe a, a lack of experience to to, to take on some fairly uh, rigorous and sophisticated levels of project management process. And finding the appropriate methodology, what I call the Goldilocks level, they're not too hard, not too soft, but just the right level of methodology and guidance. So if there's interest in follow-up there, uh, Jan, who introduced me, is about to become the moderator for our question and answer session. Uh, this is uh, uh, Jan's contact information. Uh, both uh, the local office number as well as the toll-free number, Jan's email address on our website. And our next webinar, which is usually announced, uh, but we're not ready yet, uh, is usually announced in this, in this webinar. Uh, you can go to our website and see the events, and they'll be announced soon. So as you might have guessed, uh, just a, a brief word from our sponsor. The, the, you know, the value prop we, prop we bring to the table is you know, we help make the world a better place for project management. We, we have a transformational approach which is today's theme, um, how we achieve a standard of excellence in, in execution that consistently delivers expected outcomes. And oh, by the way, battles what you go through every day if you're trying to improve in your organization. Why don't people take on these initiatives? Well, um, it's risky. Uh, for us to say we're going to get better at project management, it's, it's, it's risky to do that. Um, uh, we're not sure there's a return on investment, so if I spend money, I'm nervous about whether I can prove there's a return. Um, the realization of value, gee, it takes a while. So I'm nervous about that. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, it's pretty hard to change the organization. So it's our job. And what we do, obviously, through the, through the offerings I showed you today, is really to help drive reducing the risk, maximizing your ROI, getting some speed to value, and really drive organizational change. Um, our practices, which I'll put up here briefly, and you can certainly see more of this on our website. You can see links to these things on our website. Is uh, the, the primary driver for today, our project and portfolio management service, uh, collaboration services, which is primarily a SharePoint, uh, Microsoft uh, Office SharePoint server uh, practice for collaboration. Uh, training, our education, improvement, and competency. Application development, which really grew out of our, our, our need to bring these technologies together. Uh, project management outsourcing, which looks like fixed price monthly support uh, for your project management environment. Uh, we do an awful lot of project staffing. We not only help organizations get better uh, at project management, but we help the projects get better by supplying actual project managers. So we have that uh, talent on a staffing and flexible basis. And then Project Commander, which is an add-on for Microsoft Project. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn the floor back over again to Jan, just a uh, uh, very briefly, if I can just show you this very briefly, uh, you might recall that there's a question and answer console. And so if you click on the question and answer console, you'll be given the drop down to bring back those questions and answers. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Jan. To Jan, you're going to operate our console. Let me know if there's any questions, I assume. Thank you. Thanks, Gus. We have already received a few questions, so I'm just going to go right ahead and start with this one. Gus, what are the types of project environments that generally show interest in and benefit from this type of approach? The types of environments. Well, uh, the types of environments are what I would call uh, serious project management. I mean, we all, you know, we all have projects in our life. We, you know, we have our uh, weekend uh, leaf raking project. If you uh, live in the Northeast, that's coming up soon. And uh, you know, maybe you've maybe you've got a wedding planned in the family, or a, 
a Christmas party or something happening at the office. These are all sort of projects. But the kinds of environments we see, and I assume that's what you mean by environments uh, with this question, that generally show interest are, are, are serious project management environments. There's a serious meaning a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, people involved, uh, a lot of risk, uh, a lot of resources, oftentimes multiple locations. Uh, multiple projects going on at the same time. So where do we see that? We see that in uh, research and development. Some of the examples I use today with product lifecycle management or drug development methodology, certainly that's an application, product research and development. Uh, we see it in information technology. So uh, what I would call cost center projects, uh, uh, projects that are funded by the organization uh, in a cost center, meaning supporting the business. An uh, awful lot of money goes into IT, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware. So we certainly see that in the IT project arena. Uh, we see it in services or, or, or projects for sale, if you will. Professional services, uh, engineering services, construction management services, people who sell projects for a living need to bring a rigorous approach to project management. Uh, we see state and federal government, certainly uh, local as well, but it, we have a, uh, more experience with state and federal government. Uh, and then in corporate, uh, corporate capital planning. Uh, the big projects, you know, the uh, the things you see in a shareholders report. Let's uh, open new plants in Europe. Let's uh, consolidate our South American markets. Let's put a sales force in uh, uh, Asia and the Middle East. Uh, those kinds of initiatives, large capital investments, are are the environments typically that we see. Uh, you have another question, Jen? I do, Beth. Um have the topics you've covered today become more or less relevant in today's economy? That's a good question. Uh, I would say at the beginning of the recession, they probably became less relevant. Uh, as some many of you are aware, one of the first things we saw was uh, a reduction in, uh, first of all, external spend. So from a consulting standpoint, certainly our revenues uh, experienced a downturn immediately uh, at the beginning of the recession meaning we, we're going to bring less consultants in and we're going to spend less time with that outside help. But even, even for those things that were funded internally, uh, I would say they became initially less relevant and said, well, we've got to work on short term. And in many cases, for many companies, the word was survival. Right? So yeah, project management is important and we might improve ourselves someday, but uh, we've got to get through the next quarter to make sure we're still going to be around for that. What we're seeing now in what I'll call the early recovery is certainly a, a rekindling of interest, number one, in, in these kinds of investments. And number two, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, an understanding that getting it wrong the first time is no longer an option. You know, I, I used to use this analogy a lot, that if you walked into the chief financial, financial officer's office and said, we can bring you an approach and a system that helps you uh, uh, capture and, and count 100% of your cash accurately, uh, nobody would really be all that excited about that. Of course, if you're bringing a financial system in, it counts your money accurately. It has 100% reliability. Um, we don't see that in the project management world. I mean, it's not even close. It's embarrassing. I mean, you saw some of the statistics, and I'll just refer back to that while I'm talking here for a minute. Uh, back on uh, on slide 36, um, it's pretty embarrassing uh, how how poorly things go, how how bad uh, things are aligned with projects, how many projects fail, and uh, so. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's time has come. It's certainly, uh, uh, there's an understanding that there's uh, the old here, he, saying we used to hear, never time to do it right, always time to do it over. Uh, my closing comment for today will be, uh, there's not time to do it right, there's not time to do it over, there's certainly not money to do it over, and, uh, and there's a really a very, very strong need to get it right the first time. So uh, I'm getting the sign that we're at 4 o'clock. And with that, I will conclude and adjourn our conversation for today. Thank you very much. You can look forward uh, to having a recording of this presentation out on the website soon. And once again, thank you all for your time and attendance today.